In a double replacement reaction, you're going to be taking two compounds and doing a reaction between them. Usually they're going to both be ionic compounds and usually they're going to be gateways to start. So let's say hypothetically we took some barium chloride okay, in solution. And let's say we react that with some nickel to sulfate. A lot of ways that people will tell you how to do a double replacement reaction, but essentially you're going to switch which anion and cation are with each other. So we're starting with the barium cation with the chloride anion, the nickel cation with the sulfate anion, and then we're going to end up reversing that. So we're going to end up with the barium cation with the sulfate anion. Okay, so some people will say, oh, switch the metals or the cations. Some people will say, oh, switch the anions. It doesn't matter which one you do as long as you're consistent. Uh, but we're going to end up with barium and sulfate. Now barium is a 2 plus charge and sulfate is a minus 2 charge. So we do need to use charges and whatever we start with is what we'll end with the charges. There's no electronic changes here. And then nickel, nickel is a plus 2 charge to start and ends up with chloride which is a minus 1 charge so therefore these would be our formulas. Okay. Now the key for double replacement is then being able to figure out which of these are soluble or not. So we're going to assume the double replacement reactions are occurring in solution. But some of the compounds that result are not soluble in water. So for example, barium, chloride is very good at being soluble in water, it interacts with water well. Barium, not so much. But overall, this compound is soluble. Nickel, not that great at interacting with water. Uh, sulfate's a little bit better. Uh, or neither one of these. Both of these are kind of marginal. But overall, this dissolves in water. But when I put the barium with the sulfate, those two form something that's not going to dissolve in water. It's called a precipitate, or basically it's a salt that doesn't dissolve in water. And then the nickel chloride will dissolve. So you're going to have some means to make a prediction about whether or not this would be soluble in water, some kind of solubility guidelines. For me, uh, you're going to have the chart that tells you, you know, barium with sulfate, insoluble in water, nickel with chloride, soluble in water. Uh, and if it's soluble, you're going to put aqueous because it'll dissolve. If it won't dissolve, you'll put solid. So I actually ran this reaction earlier. Let me switch colors here for a second so we can see this. So the barium chloride is, is a colorless and clear salt solution. Nickel sulfate, the nickel is a green colored uh, solution that's clear. And you can see that green color still here. So the nickel is still dissolved in the solution. So therefore, we see that throughout the solution. But the barium sulfate forms a white, insoluble salt. So at the bottom of this, you can see that there's this white, insoluble salt at the bottom. And then there's the nickel chloride still in the solution up here. So this is a good example where I took two solutions and I mixed them together. And a cation from one and an anion from the other would stick rather than dissolve in the water. And they form this insoluble salt precipitate at the bottom here. And then the remaining two ions, they stay in solution. Now, unlike single replacement, there's not a lot of different things that can catch you off guard with double replacement. This in itself is kind of the end of the challenge. But there is one uh, specific type of, of double replacement. That would be an acid-base neutralization. So, if you have uh, an acid and a base, that will be considered a double replacement reaction, but can also be considered an acid-base neutralization reaction. Uh, in that, the hydrogen will end up with the hydroxide to form water, and then the cation and anion of the acid and base will form a salt. Usually that salt will be aqueous, a couple might be insoluble if you have you know, uh, phosphoric acid, let's say, and uh, I don't know, copper, hydroxide, something along those lines. So to balance them, there is a little trick for acid-base neutralization reactions, and that is if you look at the number of waters, hydroxides, and hydrogen ions, if you balance those three things, everything else should balance on its own volition. So currently I have two hydrogens, one hydroxide, and one water ball. So if I put a two here and a two there, That'll give me two of all three of those things, and that will balance my entire equation. Uh, so at that point, then I'm done. I put liquid as the state for water, aqueous for potassium sulfate. 
So let's go ahead and do another example here just to kind of give you a glimpse of how to do the charge balance activities. So let's go ahead and take uh, aluminum chloride and magnesium sulfur. Okay, so let's assume these are peak ways to start. Now, when I rearrange these things, I'm taking a magnesium ion, it's going to end up with the chloride. So when you write it, a lot of people get tempted to just take the subscripts and then copy it over and put them CL3, but that's not how that works. You're rearranging these charged particles, so you need to consider what they're charged on. So this is a 2 plus charge, this is a minus 1 charge, so this would be MgCl2. If we look up the solubility, we'll find that that is soluble, so that we're being aqueous. And then we're also going to end up with aluminum and sulfate. So aluminum is 3 plus, sulfate is 2 minus. Room is here. So to balance this, we're going to have two aluminums for every three solvents. Okay. And I believe that is also soluble in water, so we can aqueous. Then I would go through a balance. So now I'm looking at a case where I'm going to need two of these, um, I'm going to need three of these, three of these, and I think I'm seven. So when you do your, your writing of your products, it's important that you know that it's based on charge, and those charges are going to be constant. Let's do another reaction. Uh, let's take iron, iron 3 bromide. Uh, let's react that with calcium hydroxide. Okay, so let's do aqueous for both of the So, so in this case, the iron here, we know that this is a plus three charge based on the fact that there are three bromides attached, each with a minus one charge. So when I make my iron over here, that's still going to be three plus charged. So since this is three plus charge and this is minus one charge, it's going to be FeOH3 is the formula to give me that charge balance. Uh, and then for the calcium, the bromine, bromide, we're looking at a plus two charge, a minus one charge, CaBr2, that'll be aqueous. Uh, this is insoluble, so we would form a precipitate there. And then we could go through and balance things. Uh, we'll use the two, three, two, 